Ontario. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Uh, this is great. How many people here are Italian? I am going to apologize now for butchering your language. Uh, I lived in Italy for a number of years, and I took Italian, and I don't know if this is a good omen or a bad omen, but that my Italian teacher, completely out of the blue, friended me on social media last night, uh, having not heard from her since I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, but anyway, uh, sometimes I don't pronounce the words correctly. So, how many people live in Greenwich Village? All right, that's interesting. How many people are Italians that live in Greenwich Village? Interesting, very good. And how many people are Italians that live in Greenwich Village who have history that dates back to the 19th or early 20th century? Very interesting. I'm gonna ask you guys to just come up and give a talk. Because <laughs> clearly you have more things to say than me. No, um, so uh, the, this talk is co-sponsored by Village Preservation, and we're gonna talk about preservation, and by the Merchant's House Museum. and. It came about because I was giving a walking tour, uh, and on the walking tour was a uh, one of the members of the board of directors of the Merchant's House, and uh, he thought it would be a great. I You're not here, Anthony, are you? Uh, he thought it would be a great idea to uh, to turn that uh, into a lecture. Um, just making sure that works. So one of the things that's great about giving a walking tour is that you are forced to confront various juxtapositions in history. So there is a Greenwich Village that is the village of the wealthy, uh, the same people who in the 1830s constructed the row on Washington Square. There's also a Greenwich Village that's the village of the Bohemians, uh, the artists and the writers. And there's a Greenwich Village of the Irish, and there's the Greenwich Village of African Americans, and of course there's the Greenwich Village of the Italians, and we have a tendency to talk about these things as if they are discrete units where they do not necessarily overlap. And one of the nice things about giving a walking tour is they don't build the buildings so that you can talk nicely in chronological order about things. And so sometimes you see things when you're out on a walking tour that you wouldn't necessarily notice, or I should say you see things when you're giving a walking tour that you wouldn't necessarily notice. So. Uh, it was very much interesting to me how Italian Greenwich Village and wealthy Greenwich Village and Bohemian Greenwich Village overlapped. And I started to, uh, this, this talk is now called A Tale of Two Villages. In my mind, it kind of started as a tale of six villages. Uh, but then I did the timings and you'd be here all night. So I, I figured that I would need to sort of whittle it down. And so instead it's become the tale of uh, really the intersections of two groups here, uh, the Bohemians and the uh, the Italians, uh, who occupied, if you will, different planes of the same space at the same time. So they were both in the village between 1880 and 1920, and they were both of the village, but they weren't of the same village necessarily. And how did they intersect? So that was kind of the guiding principle as I was putting this talk together. Um, you probably don't need me to tell you, since you are all Italian, how crucial Italians are to the history of New York. Between 1880 and 1920, somewhere between four and five million Italians came to America. Uh, some of them stayed in New York for a lifetime and for generations. Some only stayed in New York briefly, but Ellis Island was the number one port for Italian immigration into the United States. And today, when they ask on the census, what is your country of ancestry, more New Yorkers answer Italy than answer anything else, including answering, I won't answer the question. Uh, which is what comes in number two. <laughs> so it's Italy, refuse to answer, and then various other ethnicities. So, uh, as is the case, I mean, we're going to talk about uh, various different immigrant groups, but one way that this has become visible to us uh, is, the, uh, is through politics. So here's a nice old picture that I found today of Geraldine Ferraro and Mario Cuomo. But uh, Italian influence in politics actually goes way back. So that's Al Smith. And you may be wondering why I'm putting up a picture of Al Smith, who you might think of as Irish. But Al Smith's father was named Alfredo Emanuele Ferraro. And he changed his name to Alfred Smith. And he was, in fact, Italian. And that's the end of the lecture. Thank you so much. <laughs> that is the greatest piece of information that I have ever dug up.
And I led with it, and now the whole lecture's downhill. But yes, Al Smith's mother was Irish. Al Smith very much aligned himself with Irish politicians because Tammany Hall, which was the political machine in New York, was very Irish. But he was Italian. Uh, in many ways, he was just as Italian as Fiorella LaGuardia, who just happened to have a more Italian name, but he was half Italian, half Jewish. Uh, he spoke both Yiddish and Italian. His mother was Jewish. Thank you, the lecture's now. <laughs> I love these faces, these are great. Uh, and so the Italian influence in politics, of course, comes down to today, and there's the governor, and there's the mayor. And, uh, but what about Italians in the village? I like this map of the village from the 1950s because this is the last moment of the village before there was a Soho. And so this map continues down to Canal Street at the bottom because everything that we think of as, you know, that Charlton King Van Dam part of Soho is actually part of Greenwich Village. And Sullivan Street is as much a part historically of Greenwich Village as Bleecker Street is. But Houston Street was widened and that created a physical barrier and then someone thought, so, ho, oh, that sounds good. Uh, and so you have this barrier of nomenclature. But just, just to keep in mind, when we are talking about the village today, we are talking about everything that stretches from Canal Street to 14th Street. And if you look at the map, uh, Little Italy and Greenwich Village, so you've got this guy's nice little four corner here. But once you include Soho as well, uh, you can see, if you take this map, you can start down at Columbus Park which is on Mulberry Street, in what today is the heart of Chinatown. And you can walk this 1.6 miles and end up here at Cafe Reggio, which is just steps from Washington Square. And if you had done that walk in 1910, you would not have been on a single block that was not Italian. So we have a tendency to think of Little Italy as this prescribed thing, and Greenwich Village as something else, and it's not true. There were differences within these neighborhoods. Uh, different people settled in different places, but it's not that they weren't both Italian at the same time. So that's just also something to keep in mind. I like this picture, so I'm gonna show it a lot. Uh, this is the history of, these are the numbers of Italian immigration in the 19th century to America. And one of the reasons that we're gonna be talking about 1880 to 1920 is that if you look here, you know, look, there's 18, what is that, 32? Three people. That's not to New York. That is to the entire United States, from Italy, in 1832. So the reason we don't talk about Italian history in the early 19th century is, well, that's it. That being said, there are a lot of crucial Italians who came to America early on. Uh, and we'll just very quickly run through them. That's Giovanni de Verrazzano, who showed up in New York Harbor in April 1524. So the first European to ever uh, sail into New York Harbor was, in fact, an Italian. Starting in 1609, we're a Dutch colony. In June 1635, a man named uh, Peter Caesar Alberti, Petrus Caesaris Albertus, uh, came from Venice. He was probably escaping the plague and moved here in June 1635. The most famous early Italian is that guy. That's Lorenzo da Ponte, who wrote the librettos for uh, Marriage of Figaro, Cosi Van Tutte, Don Giovanni. And he moved to New York in the early 19th century uh, to escape his creditors. Uh, he then left New York to escape his creditors. <laughs> he then came back to New York, uh, where he started a very successful Italian language school. Um, on the bottom row, there were a number of revolutions throughout Europe in 1848, including the sort of second push towards an Italian unification. And that man named Antonio Meucci uh, had to flee because um, because it, the, all of these revolutions failed. And so he had to flee, and he ended up on Staten Island and opened the first tallow candle factory in America. Uh, and then his friend Giuseppe Garibaldi, uh, who was also kicked out of Italy, moved to Staten Island and worked in a candle factory. Now, he obviously left. Uh, he went back and created uh, the modern Italy. So those were some of the early people, uh, early Italians who came... Uh, meanwhile, while they're coming, Greenwich Village, as you can see in this 1760s picture, is mostly farmland, and it stays farmland from the Dutch period through the English colonial period, uh, owned by big landowners. That's Aaron Burr, 
He bought uh, Richmond Hill, which again, people talk about as having been in Soho, but Richmond Hill was in, uh, Richmond Hill was in Greenwich Village. Uh, and it was a mansion that was George Washington's headquarters for a while during the Revolution. John Adams lived there when he was vice president. Aaron Burr later bought it. By the time we get to the period of the Cartesian street grid of New York City being laid out, uh, modern Greenwich Village, even though it is not really on that grid, is, is already there. I mean, there's Worcester, uh, that's Thompson, Sullivan, McDougal. All the streets that you recognize today in the South Village were pretty much in place by the first decades of the 19th century. 1821, that's it, yellow fever, right? 1821, 1822, there's a yellow fever outbreak, which sends people up to uh, Greenwich Village full-time. Washington Square is created in 1826. Uh, people begin to build houses on the row. And Bleecker Street, this is the important part to our story, becomes the really nice place to live. Uh, there's a place called, uh, what's it called? Yeah. DePaul Place, there's a development called Carroll Place, and the one you're looking at is called Leroy Place. And these were all housing developments, very similar to the row on Washington Square, created in the 1820s, so that the wealthiest New Yorkers could move out of the city and up to Greenwich Village uh, into, into nice housing. That's about the same time that this is happening. Richmond Hill has been turned into a theater and Lorenzo da Ponte is staging operas there. We know that he staged Rossini. Uh, he may have staged his own operas, things that he wrote with Mozart there. And I haven't been able to prove this yet, but he may have lived in the village at the time. So this may be, Lorenzo da Ponte might be the actual first Italian in Greenwich Village. So that's the part I was hoping that I could find evidence for before I gave this talk, but it's just gonna have to be a supposition. So that gets us kind of up to the period uh, that we're talking about. Back to my favorite chart. So you'll notice that 1832, there's three people. And then there's this blip right after that, 1833, where close to 1,700 people come from Italy. That is the first push of Italian unification. A guy named Giuseppe Mazzini has been stirring up revolution. And when it doesn't work, people who are exiled or self-exiled bring themselves to America. So we have this small number of people who come in 1833, but then you notice that the numbers drop right back down again, and you don't break 10,000 people until 1880. So in 1880, you have over 12,000 people. In 1890, you have 52,000 people. In 1900, is the first time you break 100,000 people. And then in 1907, 200, almost 286,000 people come from Italy that year. So we're looking at what is a trickle, and then starting in 1870, it begins to grow, and in 1880, the floodgates begin to open, and by 1900, a huge numbers of Italians are coming, and again, many of them uh, are coming here. Now, 1870 is important because that is the year of the Risorgimento. So there's Garibaldi in his handsome statue from Washington Square Park. And 1870 is the year that he manages to take these disparate principalities and kingdoms in Italy and unite them together into, into a kingdom. Uh, so there's a brand new kingdom of Italy starting in 1870. What happens when the it kingdom of Italy is created is two things, uh, rapid industrialization in the north and extreme poverty in the South. In part because there's rapid industrialization in the North, in part because the entire country goes into an economic recession following the revolution. Uh, one of the things that doesn't get talked about, I think, enough about revolutions is that they cost a lot of money. And so after you are successful and you win, what do you do? You have to, you have to make money uh, in order to feed your people. And, um, so people started to come to America if they could not make a go of it in Italy. And first, I am never complaining about flying coach again. That's all. <laughs> uh, first, it is passenger ship lines coming from Genoa, which is a northern Italian port. Uh, 
And then as more and more people are trying to get out of Calabria and Emilia-Romagna and Sicily, Naples becomes the secondary port. And those are the two big ports that bring people to the United States almost entirely to New York. Not entirely. Baltimore was a big port. People did go to Galveston, Texas uh, and to other places, but, uh, but they did arrive primarily in New York. But while this is happening, the character of the village is changing and not entirely because of the Italians. So this is DePaul Row, one of those wealthy developments that had come up in the 1820s, and these buildings are being converted into shops on the ground floor and boarding houses or apartments above. And the people who are moving into them uh, at first are not Italian immigrants, but are these, as the quote on the screen there says, these new bohemians. Uh, in many respects, Bleecker Street is more characteristic of Paris than of New York. This is a quote from 1877, I think. Uh, it is the headquarters of bohemianism. Mrs. Grundy now shivers with holy horror when she thinks it was once her home. <laughs> the street has not entirely lost its reputation. No one is prepared to say it is a vile neighborhood. No one would care to class it with Houston, Mercer, Green, my apologies to people who live on these streets, or Water Street. But people shake their heads, look mysterious, and sigh ominously when you ask them about it. Uh, jump to the end. Walk down it at almost any hour of the day or night, and you will see many things that are new to you. Strange characters meet you at every step. Even the shops have a bohemian aspect. For trade is nowhere so much the victim of chance as here. So this is a guidebook to New York. Again, I want to say it's, 18, it's either 1872 or 1877, warning you that if you go to Bleecker Street, you might encounter these bohemians. Uh, and we have a tendency to talk about bohemianism in Greenwich Village as being a kind of dawn of the 20th century, John Reed, Eugene O'Neill, and, and the St. Vincent Millay. Uh, but it clearly starts, if you're already being warned about it in the 1870s, <laughs> You know you're in trouble. Um, and actually, the things that started it were like, this is a picture of Faf's, which was a saloon on Broadway. It was downstairs. Uh, a lot of those factory buildings on Broadway have uh, put into the sidewalk uh, those glass lights in cast iron so that natural light could penetrate into the basements where you stored the goods. Well, at this particular building, rather than store the goods, they set up a saloon. Uh, and this. That guy's Walt Whitman. Happy birthday. 200 this year. Uh, and Walt Whitman was a big hanger-outer, if that's a word, at FAFs. Uh, and he was one of these people that people knew that if you went to Greenwich Village, he's the sort of person you might run into, is Walt Whitman. People started to move to Greenwich Village because it was gaining this reputation. You know, back in the 1830s, 1840s, Edgar Allan Poe had lived in New York, and Poe had lived in the village in what he himself called, quote-unquote, a ghastly poverty. And so, if you fancied yourself the next Edgar Allan Poe, maybe you too could go live in the village in ghastly poverty. <laughs> now, this book is, this talk is supposed to be about Italians, uh, but, uh, so we don't want to spend too much time talking about these other villages. But I find it very interesting that this bohemianism and Italian immigration are both happening at the same time. And there are some bohemians hanging out in their bohemian lair. All, the, all these pictures that have writing on them are by Jesse Tarbox Beals. And they're really fantastic documentation of, of bohemian Greenwich Village. There are some Italian workers doing piecework in their apartment. And there in between is the Frick. Uh, and I'm just pointing that out because I needed a good robber baron mansion. And uh, the, the, all of these things are happening at the same time, and it's not a coincidence that the Gilded Age is happening at the same time that tremendous numbers of Italian immigrants are coming in. Because who do you think is building the Gilded Age mansions? Uh, it's the Italian immigrants, many of whom are stone workers, uh, either working, literally working in the quarries and mining the stone, or trained artisans who can carve the stone. So uh, the fact that uh, New York in the Gilded Age is being built up, uh, well, it's being built up by Italians. Uh, we'll get back to the, the Bohemians in a second. Um, there's this classic notion, we'll get back to Bohemians right now, uh, that they were all poor. Uh, 
so that there's this idea that maybe there are two poor Greenwich villages, the immigrant poor and the bohemian poor, but they were not the same poor. Uh, there's just no two ways about it. First of all, oh, this is a, a quote from a, from a contemporary writer, uh, Greenwich Village is, quote, a refuge for undiscovered artists and free thinkers. The cheap quarters of the village allowed these bohemians to escape the dreary industrial world and live a penniless, enlightened existence. <laughs> so the, the two things to keep in mind. 90% of the people who lived in Greenwich Village in 1920, which is the end of our period, lived in tenements. So when you're talking about the Bohemians, you're talking about the 10%. Uh, the other thing is that if you're an Italian, you probably made, the average salary was $850 a year. The average rent was $20 a month. And some families had to have two families in an apartment to make the $20 a month. Meanwhile, the Bohemians were paying between $50 and $75 a month to live in their squalor. Uh, and so they were paying a premium to play poor. A lot of them were not as poor as they made themselves out to be, or considered themselves poor, but were not working class immigrant poor. And that's just, just something to point out. Um, they mixed some. Some Bohemians would go down to a place called Maria's on McDougal Street because they discovered that she had something, a restaurant, and that she had something called Spaghetti Hour. And they were absolutely fascinated by spaghetti hour. Um, some non-Bohemians, not everybody who lived in the village who wasn't an Italian, you know, they weren't, everybody wasn't an Italian or a Bohemian. Um, Judson Memorial Church on Washington Square proselytized in the South Village because this was a big thing to try to get Catholic Italians to become Baptists. It didn't, it didn't work, by the way. 2%. Um, so the Italians who are moving here are moving into this neighborhood um, that is in some ways being purpose-built for them. In 1879, uh, the city passes a new tenement law, uh, the so-called old law, and uh, it takes older, it makes a lot of older tenement apartment buildings illegal and creates this, what is called the dumbbell tenement. Uh, the law says that there has to be a window in every habitable room and, and the upshot of this is that it is difficult and expensive to retrofit older buildings. Um, it is much more cost effective, and in fact, there's now a market for it to build newer tenements. So starting in 1880, which is the year you see that big uptick in Italians coming, you see a big uptick in tenement construction. So both things are going hand in hand. Uh, this is a tenement on Sullivan Street that was built in 1880 for the Italians. That's what it looks like right now. That is the marketing photo. If you would like to live there, it is on the market. It's $2,500 a month if you would like to live in this apartment. So, immigrants move to places based on three things. One, you go where there's someone you already know. Uh, your cousin, your uncle, your sister, your brother. We'll talk more about that in a minute. You go where rent is cheap. Uh, so this wave of tenement construction was not only a boon because numbers were growing, but at least initially depressed the rental market. And you go where you can easily get to work. So another factor that made the South Village so important to the Italians is that starting in the 1870s, the first the 9th Avenue L, and then what's pictured here is the 6th Avenue L, opened up. And so it didn't matter anymore if you could get to work on your own two feet. You could get, you know, as long as, as long as there was an L that took you there, you could get to work. So in many ways, the South Village was perfectly positioned for people to be able to live and work. Uh, and work they did. The Italians showed up during an economic boom. Uh, there were a couple of depressions and recessions during the Gilded Age. But in general, uh, there was work to be found, many in construction. This is just a few things built by Italians in New York City. Yesterday was the anniversary of the Statue of Liberty arriving in New York Harbor. Uh, the pedestal was built by Italian labor. Brooklyn Bridge, a mansion on Fifth Avenue, the Astor Hotel, New York Public Library. These are all built by Italians. So you're, if you're an Italian and you're arriving in New York, you might not be paid well, but there is work. 
So life in the South Village was relatively inexpensive for immigrants, relatively accessible to employment. But as I, I noted earlier, the reason most Italians moved to the village is that somebody that they knew already lived in the village. And for many people, life in the neighborhood was organized around two pillars. One was the church, and one was what is called campanalismo, which is be living within the sound of a bell tower. Now, we're not talking about these bell towers. This is how you replicated your village from the old country back home. Everybody who lived in Sicily, in a village, who could hear the same church bells ringing, they are in the same campanalismo. So they are the same people from the same area. And when you moved to New York, you lived in the neighborhood with those people. You lived in the same building with those people. Uh, entire tenements would be filled up with people who came from the, same, uh, from the exact same town. In church, these are the two main parishes in Greenwich Village. Uh, that is St. Anthony of Padua, uh, which is still there. That is Our Lady of Pompeii, its original building. That's Our Lady of Pompeii today. Uh, from Father Demo Square. Uh, these are what are known as national parish parishes. In the Catholic Church, there are two things. There's what's called a territorial parish and a national parish. And in general, people went to territorial parishes. You go to the church that's closest to the place you live. Um, but when the Italians started to come, the first place they settled was down in what was called Five Points and later became part of Little Italy and is now part of Chinatown. And in uh, Five Points, the big church was this one, the Church of the Transfiguration. By the time of the Civil War, the Church of the Transfiguration was maybe the largest church in the world, uh, with upwards of twenty or 25,000 congregants. And it was predominantly Irish. When the Italians started to come, move into the neighborhood, they could go to this church, but the Italians raised the rent on the pews. Uh, sorry, the Irish raised the rent on the pews. And so you could only go to the services upstairs if you could afford to pay for them. And so downstairs, there was a free service. So what this ended up being was Irish going to church upstairs and Italians going to church downstairs. And this only lasts so long before the Pope, who in those days, always uh, an Italian, uh, says, maybe we can figure something out. And they revive an older tradition that had died out in this country of what they called national parishes. Uh, and so instead of having to go to church near where you live, you can go to churches with people of your nationality. And so St. Anthony of Padua and Our Lady of Pompeii were for Italian speakers. Now, this only helped somewhat because they were run by northern Italians. And almost everybody who started attending them was southern Italian. And not only were there feuds, shall we say, uh, between these groups, there was a huge language barrier. Uh, someone who is Milanese and someone who is from Sicily sometimes can't even talk to each other. So these churches were supposed to be this answer to the problem. Everybody's Italian. But keep in mind that Italy as a concept uh, only dated back to 1870. And so if you're being told in 1880, go to an Italian church, that's a very strange thing. So... Um, churches were not the ways that people sorted themselves out. In general, streets were and tenements were. And this is Elizabeth Street. That's Marty Scorsese. Those are his parents. Uh, this is a still from a movie called Italian American, which is not available on DVD. Is You can buy old VHS bootlegs of it. But it every once in a while comes on Turner Classic Movies, and I totally recommend it because it's the greatest movie ever made. And it is just him interviewing his parents in their apartment. And his father tells these stories about being a, what they called a Shabbos Goy, where he was paid to go and light people's uh, stoves and stuff. And his mom is making spaghetti sauce for hours. Uh, and it's so great. It's such a good movie. Um, and one of the stories they talk about is how when they wanted to get married, the parents they had grown up on Elizabeth Street in facing tenements. And so they met, they fell in love, they want to get married. And this was appalling to Marty Scorsese's grandparents because they were from separate villages. And you didn't marry outside the village. And so they had to go up on the rooftop and have dinner and a lot of wine later. They finally brokered an agreement, which was not a marriage between people. It was an agreement between villages. 
because as this, this is Campanilismo, as these people were coming, they were preserving their hometowns in their tenements. So this happened, this happens to be a very famous example from Elizabeth Street, but this happened on Sullivan Street and Thompson Street and uh, all of the streets of the West and South Village that, uh, that had Italians. One of the reasons you have to have a Campanilismo is that the most important saint in your life is the patron saint of your town. And when you go to St. Anthony of Padua, they only want to celebrate one patronal feast, which is St. Anthony. And that's just not going to do. So every, org every town had to have a, uh, a mutual benefit society whose primary goal was to keep the statue of the patron saint of the town from which you came so that each year it could be brought out. This happens to be St. Anthony, that's San Gennaro, but every town, you know, there's hundreds upon hundreds of towns uh, of people who came to New York City, and every single one had a saint, and every saint has a saint's day, and every saint's day has to have a statue and a feast. So mutual benefit societies became statue protection societies. They also became the place that raised money for you if you were out of work, or helped you find a job when you got here. A padrone, a father figure, would help you get a job. Often the padrones who had been here earlier uh, were well established and owned a factory or a warehouse or a store. But sometimes, again, it was this idea that if you're a foreman on a job, you went to the padrone from your town who could secure you workers from your town. That way you were all connected as family, even if you weren't blood relatives. And, again, I, I can't overemphasize the fact that you could talk to each other on the job site because you all spoke the same language. Uh, very, very important uh, in, in a place like Italy that is as big as it is and has as many dialects as it has. So men worked primarily in construction. Women worked primarily in garment trades. These are the same women I showed before doing piecework. Um, these are women in a factory. 75.3% of laborers in the men's and boys' clothing industry, and 67.7% of the laborers in the women's ready-to-wear clothing industry were Italians. So a lot of Italian women either, and with piecework you would go, you would pick up the fabric, you would do the work at, in your tenement, and you would return it and be paid by the piece for the finished work. If you're working in the factories, you're generally working sun up to sundown, because even with artificial light, it was the natural light in these factories that you needed for the sewing. Uh, some of these factories were right here in the village. This, of course, is the most famous garment factory in New York City, the most infamous garment factory in New York City. This is the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, where on March 25th, 1911, uh, the workers were caught. Uh, it caught fire. The workers had been shut in. The doors had been locked so that they would not take breaks. That's where I went to college. And uh, this is a map that shows just one small section of the West Village. Every outline of a woman you see on this picture is a woman who per a front, an Italian woman who perished in that fire. Not everybody had to leave the neighborhood for work. A lot of uh, stores and restaurants uh, were established by the Italians for the Italians. Uh, they centered around Bleecker Street. Then, as now, it was the main street of the Italian section of Greenwich Village. Uh, this is a 276 Bleecker, this dairy cheese shop, but also a market. This photo is by Berenice Abbott, uh, and it comes from a book called Greenwich Village uh, Today and Yesterday that came out 70 years ago. Uh, and uh, just a little plug, I'm writing a story about this book right now. <laughs> It'll be available soon. Uh, and it's a fascinating documentation of the village in transition. It was written in 1949, and so this is the sort of tail end of one era and the beginning of another one. Um, stores like this were often the contact points between the Italians and the non-Italians in the neighborhood. Uh, but uh, Carolyn Ware wrote this great study of, of Greenwich Village, 1920 to 1930, that points out that most of the non-Italians who lived in the village left the village to shop, and left the village to go to the restaurants, and left the village for entertainment. So they were down here being their bohemian selves, but they had, they had mobility. 
And so they used that mobility to go to Times Square. Um, and so the Italians didn't like them for that reason, but the Italians just didn't like them. And so often they would be given the off cuts of meat or the cans with ripped labels. Uh, and so it's this self-reinforcing thing. You know, these crazy Bohemians won't shop at our store. Let's give them the terrible food. Why won't they shop at our store? <laughs> it happens. Uh, meanwhile, what do the Bohemians have for their stores? Uh, who knows what this is? Another great Jesse Tarbox Beals photo of uh, the treasure box, uh, which is kind of an antique slash bric-a-brac slash art store. Uh, this is Mori, another photo by Bernice Abbott, which was a, a restaurant. It was uh, founded sometime in the early 1880s by a man named Placido Mori. Uh, and this was a, an incredibly important part of the restaurant scene on Bleecker Street. And Mori managed to hang on. He, he outlived the one-two punch for a long time. A first prohibition, which sent many restaurants out of business. Um, prohibition was great for speakeasies and terrible for restaurants. Um, restaurants were much more monitored. Um, so he weathered prohibition and weathered almost all of the depression uh, before he finally succumbed. Uh, this building still stands on Bleecker Street. Those columns are still there. Uh, they, the guy who uh, lived upstairs was a, a very young, fresh out of graduate school uh, architect named uh, Raymond Hood. And in exchange for rent, he designed the front of the building. And he then went on to build Rockefeller Center. But this is his first job, <laughs> was the front of Maury's. Meanwhile, the Bohemians decided that they liked Spaghetti Hour so much that they would start their own Spaghetti Hour. And so this is another one of these Jesse Tarbox Beals photos of them sitting in their wooden chairs with no ambiance while this one is doling out huge amounts of spaghetti. Uh, starting in the 1920s, uh, Bohemianism turns into camp. Uh, in part because when the subway opens in 1917, the subway extension, uh, all of a sudden people from all over the city can come and see, ooh, what's it like? What are these Greenwich Village people like? And so they start going to speakeasies, especially in the 20s, like this one. This is a, a, from a, a place called the Pirate's Den, uh, where the waiters dressed up uh, with parrots on their shoulders. And evidently there was swashbuckling, though that's, that was last time I looked a rifle. Uh, there was a place called the prison where they'd shut you in a cell and then pass you your drink in a tin cup. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Uh, and so uh, what I find interesting when you read about these places is that people would come down to do this and they sort of were appreciating the fact that there was an Italianness, a Latinness, as they often call it in contemporary accounts, to the village but they would never darken the door of a Latin establishment. So the Bohemians were raking in the money, running speakeasies and dressing up like pirates. Uh, and the Italians were not being sort of brought into that tourist trade because there just wasn't enough of an acceptance. They were just the immigrants, they were the poor. They lended color and an exoticness to the neighborhood. Um, who's this guy? Oh, this is Zito's Bakery. This is 259 Bleecker Street. Out of an Ellie and Son. Yeah. John's. There we go. If you ever want to do something fun, show up at John's early in the morning uh, because they still have a coal shoot. And because it's coal-fired pizza, the coal has to be delivered. And if there are no cars parked on the street, you have entered a time warp as a guy in overalls is shoveling coal into a coal chute. Uh, to go down into the basement of John's Pizzeria. Cafe Reggio, still hanging on. Now what's interesting, this one's built in 1929, which is kind of after the peak of Italians. And this one opens in 1927, just a couple of years earlier. And there had actually been a major change uh, right before this. So in 1924, the United States passes uh, an Immigration and Naturalization Act. And it says that the number of people who can come here from any country is going to be a quota system based on the number of people who were here in 1890. And again, just to remind you, in 1890 was the first time they had, uh, where's 1890? So they hit like 52,000 people, but all the years before that had been below that. 
The large numbers don't happen until 1900, 1907. So they were specifically picking 1890 to not let more Italians in. I mean, that was the goal. The goal was that people who were reactionaries against immigration thought that too many Italians were already here, and so they needed to pick this point. They had had a dry run of this with what they called the Chinese Exclusion Act. And the Chinese Exclusion Act had been passed in 1883, completely, except for people who could get special visas, completely excluding the Chinese. And what happened with the Chinese is that Chinatown, before the Chinese Exclusion Act, didn't exist. Chinatown was a reaction to the Chinese Exclusion Act. It was a way for the Chinese who were here to coalesce for self-protection and for cultural preservation. And I just wonder if places like Reggio and John's, which come after 1924, are also part of an Italian self-preservation. If there's a concerted effort after 1924, when uh, people are being told by law that we don't want you here, that the people who were here were going to make a concerted effort uh, to, to express themselves. Uh, now, what's interesting to me is that this is happening at the exact same time that Fiorella LaGuardia is, uh, is rising to power. Um, he was born in Greenwich Village. He was born at 177 Sullivan Street. So again, this part of Greenwich Village that is now not necessarily Greenwich Village. His house is no longer there. They were doing his, it was a tenement. They were doing renovations to it and it fell down. So don't do illegal renovations. Uh, <laughs> He was mayor, as you probably know, from 1934 to 1945. Uh, his father was from Apulia. Uh, his Jewish mother was from Trieste, though she was only sort of Italian. Um, when he was a young man, he left the city. He moved to Arizona. Um, and then when he moved back, he moved to Harlem. Um, and there's a little Italy in Harlem. That could be our next talk. There's a little Italy in Harlem. Um, and he represented that district in Congress before he became mayor. And um, in an era of increasing hostility towards Italians, it's interesting that Fiorella LaGuardia stands out as a beloved person. He's not just beloved in retrospect. There were a lot of people who liked him when he was mayor. And so how, how do these two pieces of data fit together? Well, two things to keep in mind. A lot of people didn't like Fiorella LaGuardia. Uh, but also, he was this exceptional individual. You could like Frank Sinatra, and you could like Joe DiMaggio, and you could like Fiorello LaGuardia, and you could say, see, I like Italians, while hating all the rest of them. So uh, it didn't necessarily mean that there was some great acceptance of Italians uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, and in, in fact, Italian uh, hostility towards Italians grew during the 1930s as fascism grew in Italy. And this was not helped along by the fact that when Carolyn Ware was doing her final survey in 1930 of Italians, and asked them, who is the most admired Italian of all time? Mussolini wins by a huge margin. It's Mussolini way up here, and then Christopher Columbus, and then a few other people who come in, like, it's straggling numbers behind. Father Demo, the most beloved uh, pastor, uh, priest at Our Lady of Pompeii, uh, had to be told by the uh, FBI to knock it off because he was getting his parishioners to send copper to the Italians during the war to help with the Italian war effort. And it's like, um, okay, no, <laughs> don't do that. So, um, so it wasn't always, the, the Italians weren't, in Greenwich Village weren't always helping their own case, shall we say. Um, but after World War II, uh, there's, a, there's a, a change, there's a shift. And in part, there's a shift where the Bohemians, the relics of Bohemianism, and the relics of little uh, Italian Greenwich Village uh, start to merge. Um, one of the ways this happens is that the cafes, many of which are owned by Italians, start to need, need find ways to bring more people in. And so first it's poetry, and then it's music. There's the gaslight. That was an Italian. It doesn't sound Italian, but the gaslight was certainly an Italian cafe. Gertie's Folk City was also an Italian cafe. This has nothing to do with anything except that it's Bob Dylan, and that house is on the market for $12 million. That's 17 Grove Street. It's a great house, if you're thinking about a tip of any sort for the, for the speaker at the end. I'm just saying that I would live there if someone wanted to get it for me. Um, 
That's Dave Van Ronk on the other side and Susie Rotolo in between. So she's Italian. See, I, I knew there was an Italian guy. Um, the thing about the South Village in the 1960s is that with these barriers broken down, you could be the sort of person who could come and hear Bob Dylan play at the Gaslight and then go across the street to Cafe Reggio and no longer was it like the people who were coming down before the war who would only go to the Pirate's Den but never go to Maria's for spaghetti hour. Uh, so it took a long time. I mean, we're a century after uh, a lot of the Italians. I read an article in the New York Times this morning uh, as I was just finishing these slides, uh, written in 1982, and it was like, have the Italians finally arrived? It said in 1982. And from the condescending tone in the article, the answer was no, <laughs> the Italians have not arrived. I'm like, it's 1982, people. So one more thing I want to talk about uh, before we finish. Uh, this is Vesuvio Bakery down on Prince Street, uh, which was run by the Dapolito family. And uh, the way a lot of ethnic groups, I said this at the very beginning and I'm circling back to it, make inroads into American culture is through politics. And so Tony Dapolito was essentially the mayor. I don't know if any of you knew him. He died in 2003. He became essentially the mayor of Greenwich Village. And he was highly connected. Um, there's a Vesuvio Park, uh, it's now in Soho, uh, that is named after him because he was still alive and you can't name parks after living people. And so people so desperately wanted to name something after him that it is Vesuvio Park. Then after he died, the recreation center here in Greenwich Village was named for him. Um, he was one aspect of Italian politics. Uh, Carmine de Sapio, who was the last head of Tammany Hall, was rose through the ranks and was the pure proof that the Italians had taken over uh, politics. Uh, don't know if any remember Bill Passanante, who served in the state assembly for years and was a, another real hero to the people of Greenwich Village. Um, but just one final thought about LaGuardia and acceptance. Um, West Broadway was renamed LaGuardia Place in 1967, which is a huge honor. Rechanging names of streets takes a lot of effort. And so for LaGuardia's birthplace to have been uh, remembered by creating a LaGuardia Place uh, is, you know, a century after the Civil War, uh, a sign of, of growing acceptance. And I think that, I've often talked about it, it takes 100 years for any immigrant group to make true inroads. And so 1967 is a good year. Now the statue is not until 1994. It was hugely controversial. I don't know if you remember this, but some people wanted a statue of LaGuardia standing like this, you know, ramrod straight. Uh, and other people uh, backed the eventual winner, which was LaGuardia talking like I do <laughs> with his hands, which makes it perfect to put stuff in. <laughs> People think I photoshopped this. I did not photoshop this. I was walking by and snapped this photograph. <laughs> we'll go back to this one. We'll give him a little more dignity. Uh, I think this statue makes a good place to end because I think it symbolizes something very important about how we commemorate people and places. Uh, LaGuardia was a key figure in 20th century New York, and so I think it's fitting that there's a statue and a street not far from where he was born. Uh, but as we move into this era of rampant over gentrification. Uh, we run the risk of losing the things that are actually Italian. You know, Trattoria Spaghetto just closed. And what happens when Our Lady of Pompeii gets sold and turned into condos? And when Cafe Reggio becomes a Starbucks? And uh, you know, when the butcher shop FICO is turned into a bank? I'm not saying these things are going to happen, um, but I'm saying that one part of preservation isn't just architectural. It is about keeping alive a fabric in a neighborhood. Um, I don't want to keep it like a fly in amber, but maybe we should be thinking about a map, some way to navigate uh, towards the future. So with that in mind, I will end with two quotes from the great Italian sage, Yogi Berra. <laughs> First, the future ain't what it used to be. And second, if you don't know where you're going, you will end up somewhere else. <laughs> Thank you very much.